proof? Is it recording? Yes, it is. Oh, this is so exciting. Okay, this is almost as exciting as David's paper is going to be. I'm very pleased he's presenting um, on his, it's not the most recent project, it's one just finished, right? On, on fire and yeah, uh, quite, I'm very much quite looking quite forward. Cool. Yeah. Thank Over you, to you, David. Thank you. You've, you've certainly raised the bar, uh, made, things, made things more challenging. Um, I too, before I begin, would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this, this country and their elders, and all the more so because this paper is partly inspired by what we now know about Indigenous land management, as, as, as you, I think you will see. Now, I'll share my screen. I hope this is going to work. Yep. There we are. I hope everyone can see that all right. Just minimize myself to get out of the picture and, and uh, off we go. Yes, yeah, so this is part of a, a larger study that aims to understand why particular kinds of fires took place at particular times in European cities between the 16th and the 19th century. And it arises from a broader interest in how early modern cities functioned, and particularly in the connections between human environment, sorry, human behavior and the built environment. It's also inspired by recent work in environmental history. As we know, bushfires in Australia are not only related to weather conditions, but they're a product of changing forms of forest management since European settlement. Now, it's immediately obvious that urban fires resulted from human actions. The largest fire in early modern Europe, the Great Fire of London of 1666, was almost certainly caused by a baker's oven left alight overnight. But human agency also created the conditions that allowed small fires to spread. Because even if a blaze had natural causes, such as lightning striking a church tower, it usually only spread because there were wooden houses built close up against the church. So the way that humans constructed the urban environment was absolutely crucial. Equally significant was their response to the fire, as we shall see. Now, today I'm discussing disastrous fires. And by that, I mean fires that destroyed significant parts of a town that caused serious social and economic dislocation. For statistical purposes, I'll define a disastrous fire as one that destroyed 100 or more houses. And where no reliable figures are available, I'm including fires that are reported to have burned a large part of a significant town. Now, of course, that's a very crude measure Estimates of damage in the sources are often unreliable. And in any case, what represented a house also varied widely. Most 16th century cities had a very low skyline and so did small towns right through to the 19th century. Whereas in 18th century or Paris, apartment buildings on the whole were much taller. So a fire that burned a hundred or so houses could be very different in scale according to local building patterns. It's a measure that's simply intended to identify very big fires that got completely out of control. Now, using this rough definition, I've identified 566 peacetime fires between 1500 and 1870 across 406 different towns. Now, that might sound like a lot, but remember that there are thousands of towns of varying size uh, across the, the sample area. And if we average it out, it represents less than, uh, we get a figure something like less than one in 10 towns that experienced a disastrous fire in the course of these 370 years. The point here is that fire disasters were not a regular or a frequent event. Now, that's perhaps surprising since most towns were built largely of wood. They had very crowded housing and narrow streets. And fire, furthermore, was used by the inhabitants every day. It was used for lighting, for heating, for cooking, 
as well as for a vast range of industrial purposes. Inevitably, there were lots of accidents and probably hundreds of thousands of small fires. So why did so few small fires become very large ones? And for that matter, why did some towns burn almost entirely, some of them more than once, when most did not? Now, if we look at those figures a little more closely, we can see that great fires didn't occur randomly. Now, in this graph, I've separated out wartime fires because if we want to know how small fires became disastrous ones, then fires that were, de that were deliberately lit as part of military campaigns uh, don't help us to answer that question. Or rather, the answer is, is a bit too obvious. So it's the chronology of peacetime fires, the ones in blue, uh, that are of interest. And here we can see a clear overall trend. The numbers rise, broadly speaking, they rise across the 16th century. Then there's a sharp increase into the 17th century. They then fluctuate a bit with a peak in the 1680s before, broadly speaking, declining slowly across the 18th and the 19th centuries, although there are a couple of intriguing peaks at the beginning of the 19th century and then again at a lower level in the middle of that century. Now, first of all, uh, this pattern's unlikely to be a product of the sources because one of the things about really big fires is that they do tend to be recorded. We, in fact, know of quite a lot in medieval times. So while I wouldn't rule out there being some gaps, uh, I think the general trend here is reasonably accurate. It's also worth noting that independently of the sheer numbers of great fires, some of the very biggest ones were in the second half of the 17th century. In fact, most of the very biggest ones, the Great Fire of London of 1666, which destroyed over 13,000 buildings. The next largest, a fire in the relatively small town of Aachen in 1656, which destroyed some 4,600 houses. Another huge blaze in Stockholm in 1686, burned around uh, about 1,800 buildings. And there were similarly large fires in Hamburg in 1684 and Dresden in 1685. So the question that this graph immediately raises is why the number of great fires rose up to their highest and most dramatic point in the late 17th century? And secondly, why did the numbers then decline? Unevenly, certainly, but decline nevertheless across the 18th century and into the 19th. And that decline is particularly puzzling when we consider that urban populations were growing across the entire period, but that they were growing fastest in the 19th century. Now I'm going to separate out these two questions, why the initial rise and then why the leveling out and decline. So if we look at the first one, why did the, uh, the number of great fires rise slowly at first and then very fast into the 17th century. The secondary literature, of course, explains great fires by pointing to forms of construction, something I've already mentioned. Houses were built of flammable materials and they were densely packed along narrow streets. And that was certainly a key factor in many cases. In the great fire in Aachen, for example, where a strong wind blew embers from the suburbs onto thatched roofs right across the town, uh, setting fire to almost every neighborhood. Wooden buildings were also very important in the Great Fire in Rennes in 1720. But forms of construction, of course, don't in themselves explain the chronology because they were present from medieval times on. And I think they're best understood as preconditions for great fires, major risk factors, but they don't explain why some wooden towns burned and others did not. Now, the argument I'm going to present is that most of these big fires happened because of disruptions to what we might call the fire ecology of cities. 
By fire ecology, I mean the relationship between fire, the urban environment, and human activity. And the disruptions to this or these ecologies were sometimes Europe-wide or systemic, beyond the control of individual city governments. In other cases, they were local. They were products of economic or social changes or of local political conditions. Now, in order to make sense of this argument, we need to have an idea of what normally happened when a fire broke out. Typically, a fire began with a banal accident, like this one perhaps, but more often a baker's oven left unattended, a candle knocked over, or somebody smoking in a stable. And most of those fires were put out very quickly. If the person immediately responsible wasn't able to extinguish them, then their family or neighbours or servants, as in this case, usually did. We have many examples where people smelled smoke, broke down a door, put out the flames. And that in fact became easier uh, once window glass became universal, as it did across the 17th century, particularly in the major cities, since fires in confined spaces generally burned slowly. And it was only when they burst out uh, and reached a better oxygen supply uh, through a window or a roof, it was only then, in most cases, that they spread rapidly. When they did break out, more people would come running because fire was everybody's business. Someone would ring the alarm bell, usually at a local church. Someone would alert the local officials, often elected municipal officers, who were responsible for firefighting. And once the alarm bell rang, particular trades or groups were in most places obliged to drop what they were doing and come running. This usually included building workers who were used to climbing on houses and who knew, if necessary, how to demolish buildings. Other people would fetch water, either in their own buckets or using those kept in a local store. They'd look out for sparks or embers that might set other buildings alight and beat them out before they could catch. If the town had fire pumps, these would be brought to hose down the flames. We can see right in the middle of this engraving, a fire pump being operated with volunteers uh, forming a bucket chain to bring water for the pump. Some places had regular volunteer firefighters whose experience was invaluable in predicting how the fire might behave. The final resort, if all of this failed, was the demolition of buildings to create a fire break. And by these various means, the vast majority of fires, even some quite large ones, were in fact able to be controlled and extinguished. This firefighting, furthermore, was complemented by preventive measures really quite early. Most towns had regulations that were put in place in medieval times. Um, which in fact seemed to have been a bad fire period. So in London, for example, after a terrible fire in 1212, new houses built adjoining existing ones had to install a stone firewall that extended above the roof line to prevent flames from jumping from one building to the next. That was the main way in which big fires were transferred. We can see two examples here. The left-hand one is from London, the right-hand one of 17th and 18th century buildings in Paris with very high firewalls between the buildings. And, and this was quite an effective measure. The London fire rules also of 1212 also required dangerous trades like bakers to plaster the walls of the rooms where they worked because plaster is a good fire retardant. And trades that used fire were forbidden to work after dark. The fire watch was extended throughout the night. So a number of measures taken. In some places, these sorts of rules also extended to building materials requiring thatched and wooden roofs to be replaced with tiles or slates. Most towns also had a curfew. The word comes from the French couvre-feu to cover the fire. So after nightfall, people were required to return home. And when they went to bed, they were supposed to put out the fire or at least cover any embers. This is a rather elaborate um, 
Kufra fur or curfew that we, we see that's held in the Victoria and Albert. Um, most were simpler or people would simply um, put some water over the, the coals to, um, or, or cover them over with ash so that they couldn't uh, break out during the night when people were in bed and a fire wouldn't initially be noticed. It was also very common for these medieval or early modern regulations to require every household to keep a tub of water handy just in case. Now this combination of measures seems to have been quite effective. London, for example, had no big fires between 1212. Before that, there were a whole series of big fires. But then after 1212, there were no more uh, large ones until 1633. But then, as we've seen, something happened. And the 17th century was to see a whole series of disastrous fires, including many of the worst ones in Europe's modern history. So what was it that changed? Well, the obvious factor might simply uh, appear to be population growth. And globally, the urban population of the area covered by my sample more than tripled between 1500 and 1800. That meant there were a lot more buildings to burn. And it might also seem logical to assume that more people would mean more accidents and that more small fires would mean more large ones. Yet in fact, when we look closely, there's no clear correlation between the incidence of large fires and this overall population growth. Paris, for example, grew rapidly across the 17th century yet experienced only one fire disaster in 1621, which was before the period of greatest population growth. A counterexample is Aachen, which I've already mentioned a couple of times, uh, that experienced the second largest European fire of the early modern period, yet its population was pretty much stagnant across the 16th and 17th centuries. So while population growth may have played some role, it certainly doesn't entirely explain the incidence of great fires in the 17th century. There are several other factors that were far more important and that become apparent if we look at the way that great fires occurred. Firstly, many of them came towards the end of unusually hot, dry summers. The Great Fire of London came after six weeks without rain. Six weeks in London without rain, can you imagine? Similarly, two of the great fires of the 1650s in Glasgow and Aachen followed long dry periods. The same happened in, in Hamburg in 1684 and Stockholm in 1686. Another long dry period preceded a very bad fire in the London suburbs in 1699. It's no surprise that there's a correlation between weather conditions and huge fires. However, like today's Australian bushfires, the disasters of the 17th century were not the result of normal climatic variation. A German scholar, Cornel Zvierlein, in a remarkable study of all significant fires in central European towns, not just disastrous ones, across an entire millennium, found that the two worst years were 1540 and 1666, both years that experienced exceptionally harsh summers. Now this might seem odd to those who remember that this is happening in the middle of the Little Ice Age. But climate historians have shown that even though the Little Ice Age brought lower average temperatures and wetter summers, it also produced what they call anomalies, exceptional events that ran counter to the general trend. And the same thing is observable today with some exceptionally cold weather uh, occurring in the middle of a general trend of warming. It's also likely that climate change brought unusually tempestuous winds, which were another feature of almost all the fire disasters in early modern Europe. One account from a small German town described the wind as satanic because it changed direction abruptly and made fighting the fire well nigh impossible. Now, of course, the end of the Little Ice Age came in the course of the 18th century, when average temperatures rose again and climatic anomalies became less frequent. So climate change helps to account both for the increase in the number of fires across the 16th and especially the 17th century, 
and for the decline in fire disasters in the 18th. But it certainly wasn't the only factor. Another general one was the appearance of new kinds of fuel in the urban environment. Buildings, of course, were the primary source of fuel for fires, but the contents of houses and of warehouses also fed the flames. And across the early modern period, and especially the 17th century, we see greater concentrations of a variety of hazardous materials. One of these was gunpowder. Gunpowder was the source of an explosion and big fire in Venice in 1509, and it was thought to be the uh, source of the Paris fire of 1621. In Mühlhausen in 1707, a fire that started in a dyer's house quickly spread to a nearby gunpowder merchants and the resulting inferno lasted five hours, destroying 241 houses. In London in 1715, a boy making fireworks was blamed for yet another huge fire there. Now gunpowder, of course, was important for the growing, rapidly growing armies of the period, but it was also used in fireworks which became far more widely available across the 16th and 17th centuries. In England, even in peacetime, annual consumption of gunpowder rocketed, no pun intended. It was three times higher in 1638 than it had been during Queen Elizabeth's reign. And repeated London bylaws testify to its presence in grocer's shops and private houses. But gunpowder was only one accelerant that proliferated in European towns at this time. Fire intensive industries like brewing, glass making and sugar refining. Uh, I didn't know before I began this project that sugar is a highly flammable substance. Um, all of these industries expanded significantly. The plants that produced them grew in size and so did the accompanying stores of flammable raw materials. At the same time, the growth in trade, particularly the Atlantic trade, filled warehouses with flammable materials, especially in the port cities. The Great Fire of London became unstoppable when it reached the warehouses along the river, along Thames Street, you can see on the map there. It began in Pudding Lane and then it was blown along into those warehouses. Uh, the, the things stocked there were unloaded from the ever increasing numbers of ships. Things like coal, vegetable oil, sugar, brandy, and naval stores for the, uh, for the maintenance and the building of the ships themselves. Naval stores included things like pitch, tar, and turpentine for waterproofing, hemp for sails, and timber, of course, for building the ships. All of these were highly flammable. And these were the kinds of products that were now to be found in large quantities in major ports like London, Hamburg, and Amsterdam, and that provided fuel for many dangerous fires. We also need to consider the contents of the houses themselves. The consumer revolution, as it's been called, of the 17th and 18th centuries filled domestic interiors with goods. Materials such as wooden furniture, cotton, silks, and consumables like sugar helped small fires to grow into large ones. Another factor when we look closely at the way that great fires actually happened is failures in firefighting, in that system, breakdowns in that system of firefighting that I described a little earlier. Preventing a small fire from growing into a disastrous one depended on getting to it early. And it's very noticeable that many great fires happened in the night or on holidays when the usual vigilance lapsed. The Great Fire of London began on a Saturday night in summer when many of the wealthy inhabitants, those who were responsible for directing firefighting, had left the city. In Rennes in 1720, the Great Fire started late on a Sunday, just before Christmas, when according to the local authorities, much of the population had gone to bed drunk. When the alarm was raised, few people arrived to fight the flames. Now, we might simply consider that bad luck, and it was but it also reflected a lack of precautions by local government. In cities where there were, by contrast, always people on watch in say Vienna or Amsterdam or Venice, there were many fires, but very few disastrous ones. 
despite those cities being just as vulnerable in other respects as anywhere else. Effective firefighting depended on good coordination by experienced people who made sound decisions. In London, by contrast, in 1666, the story is often told of the Lord Mayor being called to the fire in Pudding Lane. There we can see it on the map again. In the early hours of the morning, declaring that the fire was so small that a woman could put it out by pissing on it and then taking himself home to bed. The next day when it became, by, by which time it had become the most serious fire in London since medieval times, he and other municipal officers initially refused to allow the demolition of houses to create a fire break because of the potential cost of compensation. Now it's tempting in such cases to blame these men for their poor judgment, and there's been plenty uh, of that. But behind this, there could also be more far-reaching dysfunctionalities. Vanessa Harding, one uh, a prominent historian of London, has suggested that local government there was disrupted by political upheaval at the national level in the preceding decades, the Civil War in particular. It's also possible that the previous year's plague had led to the disappearance of experienced men and to the dislocation of networks between local officials. So when the fire erupted, the men in, the, in authority uh, had little experience and were poorly equipped to deal with the situation. There might also, in particular places, be structural issues. An effective response to a fire depended on clear lines of authority and usually on cooperation between different groups. So in a place like Venice, where a single magistrate had responsibility for firefighting, things generally worked pretty well. Paris, like London, had multiple and sometimes competing jurisdictions, but the different bodies there were used to cooperating on really important things under the overarching authority of the absolute monarchy. In Stockholm, by contrast, aristocratic army officers resented being ordered around by the city magistrates who were usually merchants, their social inferiors. And there were cases where the military actively hindered the firemen. The same thing happened in Copenhagen in 1728 when the army refused firefighters access to water in the military zone adjoining the fortifications. In Rennes too, Recent conflict between soldiers and civilians led to a marked failure of cooperation, even in the face of a huge fire. There were also very often in these cases, failures in longer term planning. Firefighters had to have the right equipment, buckets, fire axes, hooks, ladders. And by the second half of the 17th century, fire pumps that were appearing in many towns. Now responsibility for providing this equipment mm -hmm. varied but everywhere it depended on foresight and organization by local authorities. In Rennes in 1720, however, when the great fire broke out there, there were no buckets in the store at the city hall. And the one fire pump turned out to be too heavy to move and no one knew how to operate it anyway. Equally vital to firefighting was water. In London in 1666, there turned out to be insufficient water to fight the fire and that was one reason that it was such a disaster. The drought, of course, had caused supplies to dwindle, but it was also that the fact that over the preceding decades, the growth of the population and industrial demand for water had depleted the supply. Public fountains and conduits were usually reliable, but there's some evidence that in London, the city government had stopped maintaining them, instead handing the provision of water over to private companies. Early example of privatization. There are many examples across the 17th and 18th centuries where London firemen arrived at a fire but couldn't get access to water and had just stood there while places burned. So putting all this together, the rise in the numbers of great fires in the 17th century resulted from a number of specific factors that coincided in that period and that disrupted the long-standing system of urban fire management, fire ecology. It came at the peak of the Little Ice Age with its devastating climatic anomalies. Cities and towns contained more and more dangerous substances, far more flammable than the buildings themselves, that served as accelerants. In some places, population growth was probably a factor, but far more important was disruptions to urban government. 
17th century Europe was marked by large scale civil and dynastic wars, by epidemic disease and crop failures. These were sometimes linked to climate change, of course, but also sometimes to war, and they made the job of governments very much harder. The growth, growth of absolutism in that period may have been partly a response to this, and sometimes it led to more streamlined and effective government. On other occasions, however, absolutism produced more disruption, more wars, higher taxes, and the replacement of locally chosen officials with those appointed by monarchs for their loyalty rather than their capability. Now against this background, the second question I raised, why the numbers of great fires flattened and fell in the 18th century, of course, mm -hmm. becomes much easier to answer. The climate was warming again, and anomalies seem to have been less dramatic, although a few still occurred. Wars continued, but they were less often fought against urban populations, and governments were, on the whole, more stable. And even though urban growth was still more rapid than it had been in the 17th century, city authorities developed new strategies, often in fact in direct response to the disasters of the preceding century. The key strategy, of course, was introducing far more fireproof building materials. In Paris, plaster was increasingly used both for the outer and inside walls, and it retarded flames and gave firefighters more time to control them. In lots of other places, like London, there was growing use of brick and tiles, which wasn't fail safe. Uh, there needed to be a critical mass of fire resistant buildings before a fire could actually be slowed and stopped. Uh, but it was nonetheless a significant factor. Alongside that, an important change that we can also see in this particular picture was the widening of streets. Great avenues were initially built uh, as a demonstration of the power of rulers and for urban beautification. But in the 18th century context, even small streets began to be widened, mainly to improve traffic flow, but partly as a measure against fire. At the same time, controlling dangerous industries was also vital. In most places, brewing, sugar refining, <coughs> firework making and other dangerous industries were exiled from the city centre. That in fact doesn't seem to have happened in London in the 18th century where many of these industries went on operating and that was the main reason that central London still experienced some quite large fires in the 18th century. Alongside this, active enforcement of fire regulations was of course crucially important and we do find in the 18th century that local government authorities seem to have been much more rigorous and effective. Firefighting also improved dramatically in the 18th century. Now that's not what histories of firefighting uh, generally argue because they focus on the creation of professional fire brigades, mostly in the first half of the 19th century. But when we look at what was actually happening on the ground at reports of, of fires that took place, we can see that many crucial changes in fire fighting were already occurring, especially in the larger cities. The first of those was improved fire detection. Catching a fire early, as I've said, was vital, and many places put in, put in place systems for doing so. In Stockholm yeah. in 1675, a special fire watch was created, while in Amsterdam in 1682, the existing tower watch was augmented with trumpeters to provide a better alarm system. The photo is a reconstruction in the Fire Brigade Museum in Vienna of the system there. They too had fire watches uh, placed in, uh, in, on church towers uh, and in the 18th century they acquired telescopes so they could better localise any fires that, that broke out. And the flag you can see there that was one that they then held out to guide firefighters to the location of, of the, the fire once the alarm was rung. Firefighting itself was improved by new fire pumps that were far more powerful and more reliable. But even more important than the pumps was training people to use them because if the pump wasn't positioned in the right place or the water wasn't directed properly, it had very little effect. In 18th century Vienna and in Venice, 
and elsewhere, squads of firefighters were recruited and carefully trained. And in Paris, by the second half of the 18th century, the firemen were able to save the upper floors of buildings even when a nasty fire burned out one or more of the lower floors. And that's a pretty incredible uh, development. All of this helped to reduce the incidence of great fires. But you'll remember from the graph that blip in the early 19th century, uh, and then another one, a smaller one, in the middle of the 19th century. And this, I think, is explicable by yet another change towards the end of the 18th and the early 19th century, which increased the danger once again. In particular, the growing use of oils and acids in a wide range of industrial processes uh, provided new accelerants for fires in the early years of the 19th century. And they were followed by the introduction of coal fire, of, sorry, of coal gas for lighting, which of course provided a dramatic new accelerant. A number of the fire disasters in, in the 19th century began in factories and warehouses and then spread to residential areas. Of course, the new gasometers represented a huge danger to entire neighborhoods. In 1865, the Nine Elms gas factory in London exploded, killing 12 people and destroying 100 houses in the surrounding area. Now again, in due course, urban authorities found solutions. It's a story uh, almost always of playing catch up. We can see the creation of professional fire services in this light, in the light of the new dangers that were arising from in, uh, industrial processes in the 19th century. They're often portrayed, of course, as a response to the age old risk of urban fire. But in fact, I think it makes more sense to understand them as a response to a new problem. Professional expertise and more specialized equipment were required to deal with chemical fires and with the far larger buildings uh, brought by the industrial age. Well, that's been a very quick survey of a very lo long period. But it points, I think, to several main conclusions. The very first one is simply that disastrous fires were relatively infrequent, despite what one often reads in urban histories. When they did occur, they weren't random. They had a fairly clear overall chronology, one that seems to me to be clearly related to what has been termed the crisis of the 17th century, one in which climatic factors, war and civil and social dislocation were all significant factors. These factors disrupted a reasonably effective post-medieval system of prevention and firefighting. Yet not all the disruptions to that system were products of crisis. Other great fires I've suggested were linked to changes brought by growing prosperity and expansion. As Europe became more connected to an emerging world economy, so the fire risk grew astronomically, and both port cities and manufacturing centers are in fact disproportionately represented in the sample of great fires. A further key variable was the effectiveness of local authorities in, in introducing and policing preventive measures in preparing for fires, and then in coordinating firefighting. In London, after 18, 1650, they didn't do very well. Whereas in Amsterdam in the same period, facing many of the same dangers, they were far more effective. This reflected in part the nature of urban authority, its power and its willingness to take action. There's no direct correlation between absolutism and fire prevention since Stockholm continued to burn and Paris did not, even though both had strong absolute monarchies. The Venetian government, which was republican but oligarchical and very authoritarian, was, uh, was also quite effective in preventing fire disasters. So there are different forms of government. Uh, it, it's, it's not correlated to the precise uh, f form of, um, of, of government system. What does seem to have mattered in relation to fire was not whether governments were oligarchical or autocratic, but whether the local elites were united and prepared to take action and indeed to pay for action because it was property holders 
who footed the bills in response to the fire risk. It was very often local political factors that determined how authorities responded to the risk of fire. The legal powers that municipalities had, the resources that they had, which depended in turn on the wealth of the town and on taxpayer willingness uh, to foot the bill. It depended on how united the local elite was in the face of the fire risk. Everywhere, however, local and central governments were becoming more powerful and more interventionist, whatever their particular form. And within this process, the capacity of the ordinary inhabitants to influence government policy was clearly quite important, particularly in this case in demanding action where the fire risk was clearly apparent. One response to the disruptions caused by the 17th century crisis was considerable improvements in fire prevention and in fire fighting. And this played a crucial role in preventing in the future, small fires from becoming great ones. But technology was less important in this process than either training or coordination. We should also bear in mind in observing this um, uh, the shift across the 18th century, which is often it's, often, it's easy to see in a sort of Whiggish, um, Whiggish light and is often in amateur histories of firefighting portrayed in that sort of way. But we also need to bear in mind in observing that, that across the 18th and 19th centuries, at the very time that European towns themselves were experiencing fewer great fires, in other parts of the world, colonized by Europeans, there were more great fires as European forms of land management and indeed European forms of urban construction were imposed upon them. So great fires have a history. They conform to certain clear patterns. It's true that in some cases, in some individual cases, there appear to have been uh, appears to have been an element of sheer luck. Whether a fire started in the middle of the night, whether a strong wind happened to be blowing at the time. Probably nothing could have saved Lisbon in 1755 from the flames that destroyed what was left of the city after a terrible earthquake. Yet it's equally clear that whatever the impact of luck, complacency and inefficiency, self-interest and poor judgment led to disaster. But equally clear that behind all of these lay deeper social, economic and political divisions. And I think in the context of the current pandemic, all of that sounds hauntingly familiar. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, David. Um, I think there's a clapping thingy, isn't there? I can never find that, sorry. Um, <laughs> Yes, I found it. There we go. Um, <laughs> thank you. That was really very interesting. And I learned so much things, um, you know, everyday things like pasta I taken for granted was a sort of cosmetic thing actually has um, a proper function in terms of fire retardant and also these building features, which I always thought were architectural rather than of practical value. Um, and uh, I feel less bad for being unable to light the wood burner at our holiday place now. Every single time I used to do that, I kept thinking, how come, you know, there's so many fires? Maybe there weren't quite so many as I used to think. So thank you very much. Um, we do have time for questions. Um, uh, I just, I think I've got you all on my screen. Can you raise a virtual or a real hand if you'd like to ask a question, please? And then unmute your microphone and mute it again later. Roll it. Thank you. I, I found that um, fascinating in the, the um, comparison with, um, I suppose, the diversity of pandemic response was really um, I thought uh, an excellent note to conclude on, you know, the, the, because I guess very authoritarian systems have done both well and badly, and some democracies have done really well and some have done really, really, really badly. Um, so I thought that was really um, intriguing. I suppose um, there was one aspect about perhaps sort of 
not formal governance, but when you were speaking about sort of local features and kind of, you know, what we might think of as kind of, I guess, culture or, or sort of attitudinal factors that are really very, very micro, is that perhaps part of the explanation, you know, that some places as they sort of scaled upwards, a lot of the bonds between citizens sort of just frayed into pieces or or is it just too hard to determine, I guess? So it's sort of a question about the interaction of scale and, and attitudes and culture and um, community or something. Yes. Well, of course, it's, it's easy to disappear down the rabbit hole uh, looking at, at individual places. And, I, and I've done a bit of that and, and, and got into the historiographies of, of different places. Uh, but of course, then you've got to come out again and, and, and try to get a sense of what's happening on, on a broader scale. And that's where it does seem to me that, that, that some of those dislocations that you can see, particularly in the, in the 17th century, but, but, but at other moments as well, um, they, they do fit into broader, broader patterns. Um, not always. Sometimes it can be simply um, competition for, you know, over land speculation issues, change of local government, um, the way that um, a shift towards a more, um, a less democratic and uh, property owner focused forms of government. Um, this, this happens apparently randomly in, in some places at, at certain periods. So if that happens, then you may get less investment in fire fighting. On the other hand, it can happen the other way around. Um, Shane Ewan has shown that in Britain in the early 19th century, the appearance of fire brigades, which were, were, were very expensive, uh, was, was pushed very hard by mill owners who were experiencing terrible losses from, from fires. Some of them set up their own local fire brigades because it was cheaper to pay for fire engines and firemen than it was to lose your mill again and again. Of course, where they could um, uh, nationalize that and, and get the municipality or the government to pick up some of the, the, the costs, that was to their advantage as well. So you, you get these, um, these sort of local things playing into broader patterns a lot of the time, but but sometimes independently of that. Yeah. Okay, Thank I you very kindly. Had, um, Tim mentioned next and then Kat. Oh, thank you, David. Um, I enjoyed the um, sweep that you offered in the paper. And my question just really follows on from what you were just saying about mill owners. Um, I was wondering about the role of class in this story because you mentioned at several points about how important elites were in responding to the fires. So what role does class play and are these 